Welcome to another episode of Apple Time Warp. And this episode is in itself a time warp because it actually took place on the 11th of December 2017 when John and Jordan Machner were attending the Fun and Serious Game Festival in Bilbao, Spain, where they were both going to be getting awards. So before they got their awards, John sat down with Jordan and they spoke about how Jordan got into computers, to programming, into the Apple II. And then on to talking about Karateka, which is actually called Karateka, and Prince of Persia. The interview is in three parts. Some of the parts, especially part two, are done in a very noisy environment. And while we have done everything in our power to enhance John and Jordan's audio, there will be a lot of loud background noise heard during part two of the interview and a little bit in part three. So let's start now with part one of three. Part one. I'm interviewing Jordan Mechner, uh, December 11th, 2017, um, in Bilbao, Spain. Well, we're in a hotel across the street from the Guggenheim Museum where we're about to go uh, get awards. <laughs> It's going to be pretty cool. So I thought we'd just grab half an hour and talk about uh, you know, the very beginning. Talk about the very beginning of your career. Um, so I want to actually start with your mom. Uh, your mom was a computer programmer. Uh yeah, I'm afraid I'm going to get it wrong. I have to ask my mom <laughs> like about her programming of Snowball because uh, uh, one thing about my mom, she like is a stickler for details. Yeah. You know, she likes everything to be correct. But she did program. Yeah, she did program. <laughs> and uh, you know, there were like computers, like old computers and teletypes and stuff in the house growing up, like remnants of uh, you know, my dad's past companies and projects. So I actually had seen a teletype, but the idea of having a computer like in my house that I could use whenever I wanted was like not even a dream. Wow, so you couldn't use those computers in your house. They were everywhere. But no, no, they, they were like useful. old terminals that didn't work anymore. They weren't connected to a mainframe. <laughs> no, no, they were in the basement. <laughs> okay, so you had technology around you at least, and your mom was, was technical and she was a programmer. But, you know, I actually didn't know any of that. I didn't know any of that growing up. I found out later. It was just the way it was. That was like my basically. parents' past before, you know. Wow. Before so that's out. interesting. Yeah, um, it was like 1960s programming. In the Yeah, the 60s yeah. mainframe programming or mini-computer programming. Yeah. And then um, at some point, not at the house, but you saw a real computer for the first time. I mean, working. I mean, the first real computer. Uh, was probably the one in our high school. It was a PDP 1134, and it kept track of our grades and attendance. Wow. What year was that? Uh, I graduated from high school in 1981, so it was probably like 76, 77. Okay. And uh, there was a computer science class. Yeah. But it was taught by the math teacher, and she didn't know anything about computers. It was basic programming? It was basic programming, and the... Uh, and there I sort of got into it, like, and with a couple of friends, like, it was fun. And we just wanted to do that. We wanted to get in there and, you know, be able to program in basic on the PDP 1134, which is what the class was supposed to be teaching us. But was the the reason why you wanted to program a computer because you were interested in games? I mean, it was the mid 70s or the late 70s. So no, there were, I don't think there were games. I mean, there were games that you could play like on the teletype on the terminal. I remember there was a book uh, called something like a. Uh, 101 basic games and you could type in the programs in basic yeah then, david all's book exactly yeah now this was uh where it was in the united states this was in the u.s yeah in new york i, I yes i grew okay. up in chapel new york <laughs> okay it was about uh about 45 minutes north of the city okay so you're so you're you hadn't really gone into arcades and played them at that point yeah there was just sorry i mean there was uh I, mean, I remember Pong. I remember uh, that tank game where you would shoot each other with tanks. Yeah, combat. And, yeah. and I think there was a there was kind of a lunar lander game. Yeah, yeah, that but, was uh, that was amazing. I mean, <laughs> if we're talking about 1977, yeah, yeah, that uh, because it was all pinball. Yeah, in, totally. In the, in the local pizza parlor and the local bowling alley. Did you play that? 
Uh, yeah, at a certain point, like next to the pinball machine, there was like the tank wars. So it's like, oh, cool. But it didn't seem like, oh my God, this is the future. Like we're all going to be playing video games now. It's so like, okay, well, this is kind of an alternative to pinball. It's not that really more fun than pinball. It's not more sophisticated. It's just different. <laughs> right. So you did play pinball and you liked it. Yeah. I mean, pinball was like a standard. <laughs> that was the game. Standard right? thing. I mean, yeah, there were pinball <laughs> machines everywhere. So you like playing games at least. You were playing pinball and then you saw this weird Tank Wars game. and Yeah. I mean, but like among other things, it's not like it was a major. Uh, yeah. It wasn't activity. like the big deal. Uh, yeah. so, so you saw an actual computer running at, at school, right? The PDP. Yeah. And, and then we were, uh, you know, learning to program it, at least in theory. And how did you do that? Did you have a book? Did you... So the, you, the you math teacher friends? who was teaching the computer science course had the book. You know, the book that, you know, had all the information about all the basic instructions and how everything worked, but she wouldn't let us read it. <laughs> she had it in her office. It's like every day, like in class, she would teach us like a little bit. But I think she was just kind of learning programming. Herself? Herself, yeah. I mean, she was... This, <laughs> Like, she's the math teacher, so they're, all right, we have to have a computer Nothing science Nothing has changed. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, so I remember that we would, uh, like, in order to get access to that book, I would, um, like, do favors for her. <laughs> I, I mean, some people would, like, bake cookies. This is so funny. I... And this is, and I'm, I'm, sure, I'm, sure, for knowledge. I'm sure skipping because like at a certain point the Apple II came in and, and that was like 1978 and then there was still that uh, computer science class and uh, we had Apple IIs at that point yeah. in the computer science class. Uh, so I'm a little hazy on the chronology I and mean, we're talking like yeah, 70, you know, 40 70. years ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, the, uh, at a certain point, like by then like, I, when I already knew how to program, I would actually program for her in order to like get, get access to the stuff that she had. <laughs> the book. Yeah. I remember having like half an hour in her back room with the book and just like frantically reading it. Like, like trying you, to remember write down it, things. Yeah. Cause like, it's like, you know, bake cookies and you get a half hour in the back room with the book. <laughs> Did they not have mimeograph machines or just No, machines? it's like she was keeping it for herself. Like she, <laughs> she didn't want us in the class to have to blow past her book. basically. Because, yeah. Cause like in one, in one evening, like I and a couple of other friends like would have read the entire book and come in the next morning knowing more about programming than she did. Exactly. And then like, how does she justify the <laughs> class? Job. Yeah. So, so yeah, so there was the computer science class, which was frustrating, but it was a way to get access to, yep. you know, to computers. Did you tell your parents like, there's this basic language and the teacher won't let me read the book. Can I get a book? I, I don't remember. <laughs> it's uh, but what I do remember is there was a Thomas J. Watson research center about uh, you know, 20 minutes from Chappaqua. Okay. And that's just luck. I mean, if I hadn't... Was that a university? Or no, it was, it was, a it was company. IBM. Yeah, it was company. Okay. It was like one of their... It was a research center. Okay. And they had real computers. They had APL and Fortran and stuff that like no kid would get access to. Yeah. But a friend told me about it. That, uh, hey, on you know, Thursday nights, they have something called the Explorers Program. Oh. And they let high school kids come in like, and they open up wow. you know, after dark, after working yeah, hours, yeah. and they let... They would let us go in and use the computers, and so we would do that one night a week, and that became like the one day that I would look forward to all week because, like, there, I mean, surrounded by these massive, amazing machines. Uh, this is 1970, uh, probably 77. Yeah, and uh, so I could program an APL. Uh, could, you know, and I remember that book, this big orange book called APL, a programming language. I just, <laughs> I don't know where I got it, but I read it. I was like, oh my God, this is the most beautiful, elegant, mathematical programming language. It makes sense. Yeah, and then here were computers that could actually program in APL. I think at that that's point I'd read the book already, and yeah, like, while I was waiting to get time to program in BASIC, <laughs> yeah, you're class, reading this I'd other read language. This entire book. I was like, oh, wouldn't that be amazing? And uh, so here were computers that actually ran APL. So, you know, we did that, could program in BASIC, and, you know, this is all teletypes, of course. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. But, yeah, I could type in uh, programs from books, we could... Which is what yeah. people did back then all the time. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, yeah, so it was really good luck to be to happen to live in a town that was close to the Watson Research Center and have access to these because that, I mean, I learned That's incredible. more like in one evening there than I did in the entire yeah, school all year. All the semester, yeah. Because <laughs> of the withholding of information. <laughs> yeah. And then again, again, I'm hazy on the chronology, but I do know, I remember at some point, a friend of mine got an Apple II, and that would have been 1978. Yeah. And I just... Uh, I mean, he had a computer in his house. That's insane. That was yeah. like the... Yeah, he, he could actually program anytime he wanted. 
<laughs> and were you, was he a coder as well? He was learning how to yeah, program yeah, with no, you? Yeah, and he knew more than I did because he had... Uh, and at that time, people who were into computers and knew about computers and things like the Apple II were basically, like a couple of years ago, they were electrical engineering yep. type kids. Like they were putting together kits and uh, you know, he had solder boards and things like that, yeah. which I didn't really know anything about. I didn't know anything about electrical engineering. I would go over to his house and he was doing all these like projects and weird kits. And so I never really... Hardware hacking was Got about, into that, yeah. yeah. But the Apple II was easy enough... That I was like, oh my god, this is so amazing! And so I would go over to his house after school and program on his Apple II for it, you know, as long as his mom would let me stay there until she kicked me out and sent me back to. Can I spend the night? My house, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was literally over there like every day until dark nice. to the point where it kind of became annoying to the parents. Yeah. <laughs> Can you get him a computer? Give yeah. him the computer, you know. Yeah. And so of course I was. I just as soon as it existed, I started saving up my money so that I could buy my first Apple II. Okay. I, I remember the price very well. It was $1,200. Yeah. It took me like, you know, close to a year to save up that much. Yep. And it was uh, money that I had made uh, through my, uh, you know, my previous obsession of drawing caricatures. Oh, so you were drawing and making money. Yeah. Okay. As a kid, I was drawing. I, I stopped drawing as soon as like the Apple II came in <laughs> and uh, I started programming instead. And then it was about... 20 years before I started driving picked it again. up again yeah. yeah I picked it up again a few years ago as a nice. hobby but yeah but at the time that at age like 10 11 12 that was how I made money I would draw wow. caricatures at fairs that's pretty cool and so I, you did a lot of them yeah, yeah. And, and you made all the money for the for the apple or did your parents I had, I, had, I had to borrow the rest of the money from my sister okay <laughs> no my parents were very supportive but also uh, they kind of encouraged us to be independent yeah now you're gonna buy so, your own computer. <laughs> yeah. So you finally got the money and got an Apple II. Do you remember even where you got the Apple II? The computer land of Fairfield. All right. <laughs> You'll never forget that. Yeah, day. I, th I think it was because it was slightly cheaper because it was across the state line, so the state, you know, the uh, sales tax was lower, I believe. Okay. Yep. Uh, and I also remember that having bought the computer, I didn't have enough left for anything like a cassette player or. Oh, um, no. Monitor, to, to but there, that's monitor. Where, <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, that's where my parents' basement came in handy because RF. Yeah. yeah, you know, again, it was the detritus of my dad's old businesses. You know, a lot of this stuff was usable. Just you know, just positive stuff. Yeah, and I just found an old black and white monitor that worked with an RF connection, right? No, no, it was actually a monitor. Oh, it had a video yeah. plug. Okay, yeah, nice black and white. Uh, it was. I think it took a little while longer to get a color. TV and an RF modulator. Yeah. But that was cool because, yeah, for a while I was just playing. Actually, oh, for a long time, a long time, I think years, I didn't have that color TV. Oh. And so <laughs> the only time I could see my games in color was when I would go down to the local computer store and I would bring the floppy disk of whatever wow. I'd been working on. I would use their color. <laughs> and you're like, that's TV. awful. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, it's like seeing the game in color was like, wow. Yeah, probably. Yeah, it was like amazing. For I mean, the I would first check time. and make sure I hadn't made any mistakes because, you know, the Apple, you could, you had to turn on the high bit in order to go from green, purple. Yeah, to when we have blue. stuff next to each other that's high and low bit. Yeah. <laughs> Nightmare. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. So you got an Apple II in the house and then you could program yeah, every day like your friend. Running. Uh, did and and that was it. You were you were, you got, even got the, base, the AppleSoft Basic manual, which had everything in it. Integer Basic at that time. No, oh, Integer Basic. Wow, that's right, because it was really early. It was an Apple II. Yeah. yeah, not the Plus, which had the the AppleSoft. So the Plus came in a bit later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so that was um, Integer Basic, which actually was a little bit faster. Yes, and, and it had the built-in uh, mini assembler. Yeah, F six 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 G. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> um, so did you? You were you you knew basic. You had the inertia basic manual. Uh, it had GR and HDR and all those commands. Yep. It was a forty eight or sixty four. Uh, breakout was one of the first uh, little breakout. It was, uh, the one that I was. Remember, I remember made. breakout. Yeah, it came on a cassette, on a cassette uh, tape. Yeah. And I remember yeah, typing it in. Uh, you know, typing in inertia basic programs and okay. uh, modifying them and like it's starting to like you know tweak breakout and make it a little different yeah yeah did you did you ever see uh, bob bishop's early stuff on the apple II? Oh, yes that rings a bell Whoa. the turkey in the straw demo the apple soft yep yep I, I, res. I think that actually came uh on cassette yeah yeah <laughs> but again I, I remember all those things i just don't remember what order they came in yeah at some point you got a disk drive as well right oh uh, that was later 
Yeah. Yeah, no, it was cassette for a long time. The first few years. Nightmare? <laughs> oh, I mean, it was a dream come true. It was, it was like this amazing better than, not, better than turning it off and everything's gone, Compared right? Compared to waiting a week for it to be time to go to the IBM Explorers program. Oh, like yeah. Was, the cassette tape was like instant feedback. <laughs> yeah. You, know, you type it in, you run it, you find out right away if it works. Amazing. Uh, another game that came with the Apple II was uh, Apple Invaders. Yeah. Which was so far beyond anything else. It was... <laughs> You know, you've got Breakout on the one hand, which is a great game, but it's yeah. in, you know, low-res graphics. It's in basic. You can understand it. Yeah. And then here's something that looks exactly like the arcade game. Yeah. I mean, by this time, Space Invaders existed, and I was, you know, going down to the arcade and putting rolls of quarters into it. Yeah. And that was kind of a... Now you can do it at home. Yeah. And it's fast. It's fast, and it's identical to the arcade game. I mean, every other early Apple II high-res game just... Like, rocks made it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh... It was written by M. Hatta. I had no idea who that uh-huh. mysterious M. Hatta was, but <laughs> and, uh, I'll never forget it. And at some point, Soft Talk magazine came along. I can't. 1980 is when it came out. Yeah. Okay, so that was uh, yeah a couple of years. Yeah, a couple more years right. after the Apple II. So those years of two years of uh, tape cassette only <laughs> and no Soft Talk, no color monitor. You no, know, you're just black and book. white. Yeah. Um, and you had a red book. The Red Book, yeah. Okay. You had a Red Book. Yeah, and the Red Book had, you know, there were some pages that had really useful basic programs and others that just had this mysterious machine language code, like, I don't even know. And you had handwritten notes in there. So it was handwritten, yeah, it was pasted up, it was, so yeah, it's like this, uh, it's like this mysterious uh, book of sorcery, you know, it's it's, it's like there's some stuff. (laughs) Everything in here that if you only you could understand it. So it's exactly the way I felt about the Apple II reference manual, which was like the Red Book. If only I could understand everything in this damn book, I could master this computer, you know? Yeah. And there were books in the computer store. Like when I, I mean, occasionally I would take the train into the city yeah. and go to a computer store and kind of look at everything. Computer and eventually land. the salesman would be like, hey, kid, get out of here. It's like, <laughs> yeah. uh, you're not buying anything. Get out. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. they were so... Yeah, know. buttoned up in their IBM role. Not, there wasn't even an IBM PC yeah. at that and time. Even but. the home computer stores at that time, like they had no use for kids. Yeah, yeah, they had no idea. Although games are starting to like hang on the walls, right? Yeah, games are starting to appear in Ziploc bags. Yeah. <laughs> so you, so you were, uh, were you making entire games and finishing them at that point, or was it just a bunch yeah. of little demo programs, or what? No, I was making games, but they were modest games. Like I didn't do anything that took longer than a weekend, really. Okay. But I made maze games, uh, you know, games that would generate mazes, and then you had to like make it through the maze without, yeah. you, know, you know, if you bumped into a wall, you got sent back to the beginning. That <laughs> oh, kind nice. of thing. Uh, I don't remember what year Tron came out, but I remember like sort of copying the games in Tron, like the motorcycle. Yeah, it was like '82, I think, when they came out. Oh, was that late? Yeah. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah, in the arcade. Yeah, because Pac-Man was like '82. No, no, the movie Tron. Oh, the movie Tron. That was '80, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you you saw the movie and you wanted to. Like, it was pretty cool. The game had like multiple modes, which was pretty neat. It wasn't just the light cycle stuff. But okay, you, yeah, that was later. No, but it was like right when the movie came out. You're like, bam, low yeah. res, light cycle low, game, right? <laughs> low res, yeah. And I was, I was starting to experiment with high res, but that was a bit more difficult. Uh, let's see, there was Scott Adams and his text adventures. Yes. So I tried. What make, was your first one? Do you remember? There was a Dracula one. Count the count. The count. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I played them all. Yeah, that was awesome. And that was machine language. Yeah, it's twenty sector yeah. machine language. Yeah. Like, was data. Um. So, were and, there any games that inspired you while you were, you know, making some stuff? But you're playing games. I pretty much played every game that came out. <laughs> yeah, and the, the which way, ones do you remember? Okay, I can't. I can't remember the order that they came out in, but I remember Sabotage. Yeah, you know the one yeah. with the Mark turret. Allen. Yeah, yep. and the like that was just beautiful, simple, elegant. It had kind of a physics in the way that the. Uh, you know, the planes would blow up if you hit them. Yeah. And the people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just very simple, elegant gameplay. Uh, there was uh, some of the early Broderbund games. I remember Droll. Uh, remember the, se- the serious games. There was kind of a Pac-Man ripoff. Yeah. Yeah, Puck-Man. No, it wasn't Puck-Man. It was uh, Jawbreaker. Yeah, that was Olaf Lubeck who did that one for Sierra. Yeah. That was uh, yeah, based because John Harris did one and it was too close and they didn't want to get sued so they just changed up and made jawbreaker um 
Oh, but, there's a, the, <laughs> like, let's talk about asteroids. And yeah, that's right. the story there. <laughs> you were playing some asteroids games on the on the Apple II as well, right? Well, no, I was playing asteroids in the arcades. 1980, yeah. Yeah, 79 maybe, 80? Yeah, it was 79, you're right. Okay. It was 79. So the asteroids was like the new thing that came along and that replaced Space Invaders, and I was completely addicted to it. Yeah, I mean, that was like the... Best game ever. Yeah, and I got so good at it. I mean, I just... Play forever. For, I don't even want to think about how much money I poured into <laughs> Asteroids, but yeah, I could play forever. And I love it, and I was like, okay. So this was my, uh, yeah, this is 1979, 80, I'm in high school, and I'm thinking, okay, I've, uh, you know, I've had my Apple for like a year, mm-hmm. and I'm, you know, basically, I think I understand high res now. I'm going to do for Asteroids what M. Hata did for Space Invaders. Okay. I'm going to do a copy of Asteroids for the Apple II, which is like pixel by pixel accurate, Perfect, just yeah. like Space Invaders is. And at that point, I I had, didn't know who M. Hata was, like what country he was from. <laughs> yeah. You know, how, for all I know, it's he had mysterious. access to the uh, to the ROMs for Space right. Invaders. But, <laughs> like that would matter. Yeah. But I was like, no, okay, with asteroids, I mean, I'm just going to go to the arcade, and I, I went with graph paper. Oh, nice. And I copied down the shapes of the individual rocks. <laughs> nice. Yeah, you because know, I, I really wanted. I was like, and at some point there was like some Apple game that was like asteroids. Yeah. But, but to me, like, ugh, no, it's not asteroid. The scoring is wrong. The shapes of the rocks are wrong. It doesn't have the feel that the arcade has. Yeah. I want to make a game that's going to be... And, of course, there were other Space Invaders-like games because once you know something was successful, people would just like, rush out all oh, of these totally. clones and rip off. So, <laughs> but to me, it's like, yeah, no, there's all those like low-quality clones, and then there's the actual Apple Invaders, which is awesome. Yeah. So I'm like... You wanted to be the Apple Asteroids. Yeah, I, I wanted to like, <laughs> have that level of quality, and I thought, okay, that's going to be my ticket. Okay. What was the ticket? Ticket to what? Oh, well, money for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> so you can get a disk drive and a color monitor? Is that... Yeah, get a disk drive. Get you know. At this point, there were other things like printers. Oh, yeah. And, well, and also just because like, I'd, I'd spent all my money, my life savings on this computer, and I was kind of haunted by the feeling that like I was never going to get that back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you owed your sister money, too. Yeah. So, so if I could just get back the 1200 bucks I spent on the Apple... <laughs> It's like then I would be in the black. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that, that, so that was kind of the target. But also, I sort of had the idea that like just kind of seeing that like it was uh, that Apple Invaders was sold with every Apple. Yeah. Uh, that you know he must have made like tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars from it. It's <laughs> he probably got a really printer sorry. out of it like Bill Budge did. <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of had the feeling. I mean, talking about you're talking about like a like a 16 year old's idea of economics. Yeah. <laughs> so all of, all of this, like the idea of making thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars, was so far beyond anything I'd ever actually had. Yeah. But at the same time, like my logical brain told me that this should be possible, and occasionally I would see or hear hints that you actually could like make, make money. money, like enough to actually like, <laughs> as much as you could make by having a real job by doing these computer <laughs> games. And some people had figured out how to do that, like M Hata. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, one soft talk magazine came out, and I started. You know, oh, Mar- top thirty. Yeah. yeah, there was this, and then Margot Comstock actually started publishing the first interviews with the people who made the games. Yeah. And that was this is before the internet. That was my only and first source of information. Yeah, I had exec people. something on. Yeah, it. exec like, serious, yeah. exec Broderbund. So I would just life. devour that. I would every month I would read soft talk cover to cover, and then I would go back and I would read it again. Like I, I, I kept every soft talk magazine. Nice. For years, I mean, this was my one source of information about the industry. So, occasionally there would be a, like a mention, you know, in an article like that, that some programmer had of a particular game had made like tons of money from it, and that enabled him to quit his job. And like, yes, I oh really my god, if, if they can do it, I, thought, I feel like I should be able to do it because I'm looking at their games and I'm looking at mine, and I feel like there's not so that much difference. <laughs> yeah. So if I can just yeah, get, but were your games in six five zero two? At, at this point, point, at this point, uh, they were yeah. By the end of seventy nine. So how did you how did you learn that? That's um, a huge jump from basic to six five two. Yeah, and it, it was little by little. I mean, I didn't learn it all at once. I would uh, look at the code for the games, you know, that I bought. Yeah, and and look at it and try to understand it. And occasionally, I kind of figure figure something out. I didn't know all of the instructions, but I got most of them. Then there was this book. Uh, I got a book from, again I, I didn't buy it from a computer store but a friend a friend six. had it and, and xeroxed every page of it i'm pretty sure it was rodney zax's book programming the six yeah two. and there's like there was one page for each instruction and then there was little diagrams that i didn't understand in no op codes yeah <laughs> that was yeah the but the op codes were book. easy i mean you, you could uh, just disassemble 
the code and you could see you know what it was you know LDA A9 and, mm-hmm. and so forth yeah, if you if you were looking at the book that had no opcodes in it, and you're looking at the Apple II, and you're trying to cor- correlate them, but if you're just reading a book to learn what to type into a computer, that book had no information in it that you could use. Yeah, it was not a teaching book. It was like a reference. It was a theory, a theory, a theory CPU theory book. Yeah, it was the thing that should have been like the appendix in the back of the book that didn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> that would have said, this is how you... <laughs> Here's how you type, you know, program here, here it is. Language. 602 is just like this. So you figured it out, I guess, from... From that and what you saw in in memory, yeah, right. I figured out ninety percent of it, and I would say that there's still ten percent of sixty five hundred two that I never learned. There were some, like the instructions that included S. Oh yeah, so yeah, TSX and you know T TXS. Yeah, because I never quite understood what the stack was or how it worked. Yeah, you probably shouldn't have messed with it anyway. Like, yeah. They didn't matter. <laughs> yeah, you kind of didn't need to. It's yeah. Like, at, at a certain point, I was like, okay, I can pretty much do everything I need to. Yeah. So that worked. Yeah, and so. My assembly language programs got more and more ambitious. Were you were using what were you using? Oh, the uh, mini assembler. Oh, really? The yeah. mini assembler. So no source. No. <laughs> no, it's the mini assembler. Why not? Yeah. You didn't know that there were th- such things as assemblers that you could type in code and save it out as source and everything. No, and I didn't have a disk drive. Oh yeah, that's so, a killer. So I uh, I started making my asteroids game this was okay. like the, the pixel course. perfect yeah <laughs> yeah and and this i actually worked for about a year on it wow so uh in terms of scale it was like way bigger than anything i'd done up till then it was uh i mean because it had you know to do asteroids you need a certain amount of architecture but because it's the mini assembler that's tough yeah, yeah, yeah. you're writing code at the beginning of pages and stuff and leaving space and yeah yeah, yeah. And, and so like when i thought that I might need, I put in a, a lot of knobs, you know, n- <laughs> just to kind of leave space in case I needed to add some other instructions. And sometimes I'd be like, ah, oh, I need to put another instruction in here, but there's no room. So I would take jump. The, yeah, exactly. <laughs> to yeah. Patch you take two, two, two byte instructions, put a knob and then a jump. It yep. takes three bytes to somewhere else. Jump at the end of it. <laughs> yep. And then of course that slowed it down a bit because a jump and a jump back takes a certain number of cycles, but you know, easier than like copying the whole thing and moving it oh I mean, god yeah yeah that's a nightmare because you didn't write self-relocating code probably because no, you think you would have to do that no, no and i had a sheet where it was like you know each byte was uh in each memory location i had a little reference for like what this was this one is the x coordinate of the spaceship yeah this one's the velocity. so you kept notes yeah you kept notes yeah, on yeah. your variables yeah and it was all like by hand on graph paper <laughs> pencil and paper nice and then there's the actual code which is saved at the end of every day on a cassette tape oh wow every day did you just overwrite the old stuff or did you have two tapes or well after having the had the experience once that i overwrote <laughs> something which was corrupted and then the cassette stopped working oh, and shit. then i had to go back and like redo the previous two weeks work oh my from, god you know i didn't make that mistake <laughs> yeah that was not gonna happen I started again. rotating cassettes <laughs> how did you uh learn high res i'm trying to remember I, I remember that when i got to broderbund this is you know fast forward 1984 when yeah. i done Karateka and I, and I go to Broderbund and San Rafael and I meet other programmers other like professional programmers for the first time oh, yeah who were they do you oh yeah there was Roland Gustafson okay Corey Kosak Robert Cook author of Gumball yeah uh, there was uh, I think Ken Bull had just been hired there was Dane Bigham oh yeah Dane uh, was there Glenn Axworthy okay and so Dan Snyder or Dave, Dave Snyder. David Snyder yeah. was there yeah uh, Chris Jockinson oh yeah yeah so I just that, that was a oh my god like a, yeah they taught me so much and i was like oh my god the way i've been doing it for years is just like there's a better way and one thing that uh, like the caveman rolls in the <laughs> and I mean, one example was to have lookup tables because i've been calculating oh my god seriously? i've been calculating the uh yeah the, you know, the, the locations yeah, yeah but I, and I, I i don't know where i got the routine that did that maybe i don't think it was in the red book but i got it from somewhere maybe i copied it from somebody else's program yeah but it's slow yeah because you know it's, it's, a, bunch of, it's a bunch of yeah. math you have to do like every time you want to put a byte or a pixel to the screen you've got to do this calculation that slowed things down so the lookup table was like <sighs> unbelievable yeah yeah I mean, it's, they're it's, like why don't you just use a lookup table what it's like lookup table i never thought of that i'm <laughs> turning my screen upside down now <laughs> yeah i mean it took a chunk of memory but those as well you have 16k of memory which is a ton yep yeah, so, that's so crazy yeah so how did i learn high res again i was just looking at programs that uh you know, you hit reset. Bit, bit, oh, yeah, you yeah. Them, you, and you sort of go through it line by line, trying to figure out how they did it. 
until you find something that I don't understand. And then you think, yeah, pull that out. Put something on the screen. You know, experiment with it. Try changing it and seeing what it does. And finally, you can figure out like what that code is. Rewriting it's, that all down on paper. Like, this is crazy. You know, like this memory layout. You know, it's nuts. No, it's like hieroglyphics. It's like trying to like to understand. A, You're cracking a code. You know, an ancient scroll. Yeah. <laughs> You just, you're just cracking the code of Hira's after cracking the code of six five zero two, right? Without exactly. having a book to teach you either of those things. Exactly. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. And, and the people that I'm trading tips with at this point are my friends in high school. Yeah. <laughs> Do they know really... this stuff too, or well, were you the one going forward? And... At, at a certain point, I was. I became like one of the more advanced. Yeah. Of my friends. I mean, the the ones who were a couple years older in the beginning. My original friend who had the Apple II, he was like a senior, I think, when I was a sophomore. And he knew, like, about... He, he would have known what a stack was. But by, by then he had graduated and gone off to college. Yep. So he was gone. Yeah. So, <laughs> so by the time I was a junior, senior... I was a senior by the time I was doing Asteroids. Yeah. You know, I was probably the one in my high school who knew the most. So, nice. So the others... Oh, yeah. I'm really sure the anymore. teacher wasn't even a blip on the... Oh, no. She, she was... Uh, <laughs> no way. Basic. Although this teacher... Okay. <laughs> uh, she was funny. So she, she was my source for uh, games... Oh. Because she had pirated copy of every game that came out. She had a shoebox full of them. <laughs> and uh, so I would, at that point, I was a good enough programmer that I could uh, actually, uh, she had, a, she was moonlighting. She had a job programming for a local utilities company, I oh, think. Oh, wow. Okay. And it was like the most, it was like some simple, uh, basic uh, stock keeping program or something, but she'd been paid by them to do it. And it was a little bit over her head, so she had me do it. Oh, wow. And uh, my, my reward... Give some games, yeah. She, okay, she gave me f- blank floppy disks. She gave me Whoa. computer paper. She gave me stuff from the school. That was school, some expensive stuff. Room. Those disks were expensive. Well, yeah. <laughs> and, she, and she would give me, like, 20 minutes in the back room with her shoebox full of... Pirated copy. Disks. I would be copy, copy. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So all completely What legal. did you use to copy? Well, she had... Uh, at school, they had... Uh, they had uh, what was the program that the, the preferred pirating program? <laughs> was it Locksmith? Was it the uh, oh, Pirate's no. Friend? Uh, no, I think these were crack, these were crack discs already. Oh yeah, but you had to copy them with something. You know, I don't remember <laughs> something copy a you know something yeah. like that. Um, so and again, I'm hazy on the timeline because by the time I was doing that, I must have already had uh, a disc drive. A, a disc drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it was about. It was about six months into programming Asteroids that I got that. I finally got that uh, disk drive. floppy disk drive, oh and that God. made things go faster. Because, the world was so yeah, different. saving the whole, as the program got bigger and bigger, saving it onto that took a long time. <laughs> so then you, uh, so how does Asteroid Field relate to your Asteroids game? Well, so <laughs> I was taking kind of a long time to do mine because I wanted to do it right, and every time, like I was living in fear that someone else would beat me to it. Yeah, <laughs> and so then when these other like, Asteroid Field was one came out. I would say, oh, you know, I would go to the computer store and they'd be like, oh yeah, there's this new Asteroids game. So I, I would buy it. Yeah. You know, I'd actually pay cash for that one because this is the competition. You need it now. Yeah. yeah it's like tw- like 20 bucks or 40 bucks yeah. for a game, which is like, it's like 40 bucks. Yeah. That would set me back. Like, <laughs> and, uh, I would take home and play like, okay, whew, to my relief, it's like, from my point of view, it just doesn't capture, you know, it's, it's, it's not, not perfect. Yeah. It's yeah. not the perfect clone. And I had this in my head that the way to be like the killer Asteroids app was to be like the more accurate. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, arcade clone. That's what the market wanted. So, finally, I sent Asteroids on a floppy disk to publishers, and uh, Hayden Book Company in New Jersey was the publisher of Sargon, yeah. the best uh, yeah. Apple II chess playing program, and they responded. They were like, "Yeah, we'll publish this." Wow, I'm like awesome. So I'm I'm in high school. I'm like I have a publishing contract, and it was for, you know, it was a royalty deal, and I did, did the math, and I was like, okay, so from reading soft talk magazine i have an idea of how many copies it's possible to sell and i'm like okay if this i'm going to get something like five bucks per copy sold Whoa. <laughs> so if we can sell a few thousand copies i'll be like yeah you know, you'll in, have so much more black beyond yeah. my wildest dreams so i'm just like okay this is it i'm almost there and then everything ground to a halt because i was like waiting for hayden to publish the program and then they would call back and say okay Listen, we got a letter from uh, Atari. Oh, because <laughs> you're making it so perfect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, our, our lawyers, you know, are kind of worried. So we can still publish it, but we just need you to make some changes. So the first thing they say is, "Can you change the shape of the rocks oh. so that it doesn't look exactly like the arcade?" And I'm like, "Oh, damn! I went to so much trouble." But all right, so I change the shape of the rocks and then send it to them. A few weeks go by. 
call back and they say, yeah, our lawyers think they're worried. You know, it still looks too similar. Can you change the scoring? Well, so it's not like, so it's okay, not exactly, yeah, exactly the same scoring, number yeah. of points for you. You're like, the whole reason yeah. I made this game. <laughs> so that at this point, this is like 1981 by now. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've, I finished high school. I've, you know, <laughs> moved on. I'm going to go be starting college in, in the fall. And I've got this publishing contract, but it's, they're not publishing it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, and I start programming another game, which is uh, Death Bounce. And this <laughs> is an Asteroids clone. Okay, another one. Yeah, but this is like colored bouncing balls instead of rocks. Oh, okay. Like yeah. uh, Blister Ball? There was a game called Blister Ball that did that bouncing. Was it? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a combination of asteroids and billiards. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's it's, totally Yeah, and at, yeah. The, at this point, I'm not even trying to copy asteroids anymore because I've learned from Hayden that, Don't do that. that doing exact arcade clones is... Not bad, work. bad idea. I'm still hoping that Hayden is going to publish Asteroids in some form, but by this point, you know, they've I've changed the. Uh, yeah, I've changed, so you've changed so much. Oh, yeah, I've changed even... the spaceship to like a little skull that's <laughs> flying around. It's, I basically, it's, you're shooting hamburgers. It's jawbreakers. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I basically like the equivalent of turning Pac Man into jawbreakers. Yeah. I've made it different enough. And I remember by this time I'm at college, I'm, you know, it's freshman year, and I get a call from Hayden and they're like, okay, listen. Can you take out the shooting? Oh my god! And at that point, I'm <laughs> we're like, done. Okay, there's no point. We're done. Yeah, we're done. A year and a half of work down the drain. Wow. Uh, oh, and I think I'd gotten a five hundred dollar advance from them. Yeah. And they asked if I could send it back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I did all this work. This is worth yeah. way more than five hundred bucks. You guys ate my time. You know. Yeah. No. So I was like, do I have to send it back? And I called my dad, who was my like business advisor. Yeah. I was like, do I have to send it back? And he's like. No. Was it in the contract? No. no. Yeah. He's like, you, you, you absolutely don't have to send it back. Nice. Yeah. I was like, okay, well, that's something anyway. Yeah. 500 bucks for a year and a half. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, <laughs> you guys. Yeah, so, so at that point, I just put all my energy into Death Bounce, which was an original Asteroids-like game. And <laughs> original I, 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 had, Asteroids I had gotten like a lot better. <laughs> I had learned a lot on Asteroids. And this one, I was using the SC assembler. Oh, finally. Okay. So, yeah, I was not using the mini assembler anymore. Bob Sander and, Cedarloff. Yeah, I think yeah. I might even have been giving the variables names. All right, you finally, know, in, in, not memory of, locations. Instead of like, you know, you know, dollar sign B8 is the X coordinate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah did you use, you use zero page a lot for your variables, or did you put Yeah, I use zero page for the most important variables because yeah, yeah, it's it faster. Faster and shorter. Yeah. More compact. <laughs> but there's only so many zero page. And how did you things. find out which ones were okay? Um, <laughs> there, was there a list somewhere? Beagle Brothers? Did you ever have any Beagle Brothers charts? I don't remember that. I, I think uh, I think that was just kind of folk knowledge. Okay. You know, at a certain point, you kind of figure out which yeah. you know, zero page locations are being used, and just like write down what they are, and you just remember <laughs> to avoid those ones. Yeah. <laughs> Always remember, don't touch the stuff. Cool. Yeah. So, so you made Death Bounce. Yeah, right? and that was freshman year uh, at college. At Yale. At Yale. Yeah. Yeah, and. Uh, I sent Death Bounce to Broderbund Software. That was my first contact. With wow. Just go to the top. Yeah. <laughs> and I got a phone call from Doug Carlston. Who, wow. Which is super exciting because that was like a name and a face that I actually knew from, uh, yeah. from Soft Talk. From Soft Talk, yeah. Yeah. So he called me and he's like, yeah, this is a great, uh, well done machine language program. Uh, you're a good programmer. You know, we'd love to work with you. But as far as the game itself, this is it's kind of old fashioned. This is like a very... 1981 game like to see what's selling this year you know you should look at our new game shoplifter oh yeah and i thought i hadn't seen it i thought he said shoplifter so oh no <laughs> i imagined a game where you're going around stealing stuff soft Talk did a did a joke on that oh, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so uh i was like no i haven't seen it he said well i'll send you a copy it's like by the way you need a joystick to play it i'll send you one he did he, he sent oh, nice a, yeah. a joystick or something yeah he said but this belongs to our QA department so just be sure to send it back okay. when you're done testing out the game and he did he sent wow. me a, you know a TG was it yeah. a TG yeah, yeah I think probably. joystick and, uh, popular. yeah at that point I'd only had the game paddles <laughs> nice so the joystick was nice and I played Choplifter and it blew me away I mean, it blew me away it yeah. exploded my brain I was like okay this is a game that's not even trying to be a copy of any other arcade game it tells it's a story next level. Yeah. Yeah. and it's not about getting a high score it's not about playing forever that whole Iranian hostage crisis right here in the game yeah and little people <laughs> who are running around and they wave to you and at the end if you've saved all 64 you know, the crown yeah, yeah. it's the end yeah, it ends. Yeah, not now. game over. The end. Like, yeah. It's a story. It's a game that tells a story. That was a big moment. Yeah. yeah. So that when I saw Choplifter, that's when I said, okay, Death Bounce is the past. 
you know, this is that arcade. Like, stuff, why yeah. didn't they realize this a year ago? Because everything about the format of arcade games, coin up games, was to get you to keep putting quarters in forever. But the economic model of computer games is you pay forty bucks Premium. and you own it. So why make people play forever? You don't have to. Yeah. What? Why make them die and die and die if they don't keep on paying? Yeah. Yeah. So at that point, I started uh, thinking of new ideas for games, and uh, Karateka That's that great. came out of that. Part two. So yeah, that was pretty cool. I remember seeing um, the climbing up the cliff was the first thing that, that that told me this game is not like any other game. You know, with Karateka characters coming up the cliff. Because it shows how he got there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like you climb up the cliff and and, uh, and so like wow, this is really cool. And then I had played Karate Champ, you know, uh, already in the arcade. So I was like, oh man, this is the Karate Champ. <laughs> So, um, so it was cool. That it was simplified to a high kick and a middle kick and a low kick and the cool. I love the sounds, <laughs> you know. And the digitized uh, ki. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounded really good. And uh, was that in the red book? The, the, I think it was. A it, I think it was. I mean, it was basically just like taking it right out the cassette port from the yeah cassette yep. port and like sending it to the. It eat up memory pretty quickly too. <laughs> it depended on your sample read, but it could eat up memory pretty fast. Because I've yeah. done, I yeah. did that too. The original key I reported sounded amazing, and it took up the entire all of memory. <laughs> memory. Yeah, I just like find a really short version. That, yeah, you're like holy crap. Um, did you? You were page flipping. Right, you had, it, yeah. yeah, you had a page flip, um, and uh, and you had all kinds of oaring and shit going on in the background with the gates drawing over Mount Fuji in the background and the sky and everything. Yeah, it's, that was so is there a parallax team? And when you're inside, you know, when you're fighting the, the dudes and the eagle and stuff, and you can see through the windows. <laughs> I, I think because uh, there's really not that much moving on the screen because for the the gates that are scrolling by and you know, they pass over Mount Fuji and I think I just have like seven versions of that you have like, to have seven versions right of and then I just rotated and just redrew <laughs> depending on where you're at you know that's such a funny like that yeah. whole pre-shifted shapes you know <laughs> people will never know how horrible like the torture and the memory eating that that's thing about having seven frames of of uh, something that had to draw anywhere on the screen is you could embed animation into it. So you like take you care of your animation at the as same time. Moving, yeah. yeah, as something is is going from you know all the, the possible positions, you can actually make it animate. So as the bird goes across the screen, it's animated. You know, because um, if you didn't do that, you were eating up insane amounts of memory. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was, and I was inspired by Choplift for course, the scrolling. Yeah, that's right. Because I had really cool scrolling. It was, it was uh, that 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 fence that that did the cool perspective. Yeah, it gave so much depth. Yeah, it was really nice. Um, and everybody, uh, you know, everyone, when, when Top Ultra came out, it was just like, oh my god! Like, it was an example of what games were going to be, which is not copies of the arcade stuff. You know, because arcade, everybody learned off arcade games and just replicated them to get good at programming. And then you can start making things that no arcade has in it, you know, like like Karateka. So um, I made so many games, you know. That, then there were then there's like the whole maze maze genre of game, which really wasn't a thing in the arcades because that was there were some in the arcades, but not stuff like on the PC. I don't like, remember seeing anything in the arcade that would generate a random maze. I don't know, not randomly. They weren't ran- They were designed in, in, in arcades. But um, there were games like, if you remember Head On, which was the simple maze where, the, where you're a car and there's, a, there's, a, there's an AI car. You're going one direction, it's going the other direction. You're trying, you can only shift lanes in four places and you don't want to hit that car. So you're like going towards each other and you're trying to shift lanes into the other lane and you're eating dots like Pac-Man. And so that's, that's basically how that, that was like one of the simplest maze games. And then, and then it was yeah. Pulsar Two was a really cool one in 1981. That was um, a maze game, you know. That that was it was a designed maze game. You're still eating dots, yeah, but now spaceship type stuff, you know, or weird space characters going through a maze. There were so many. Like Minotaur was an amazing maze game, you know. <laughs> it's all mazy, but but it's like bigger than you. <clears throat> yeah. I remember there, there was a while where I was. <laughs> 
putting a like I, I redid my maze program a bunch of times trying to make it faster and more efficient. Like like how fast could I generate a maze? Did, was it an assembly when you were doing it or I don't remember. I think probably basic at that point because yeah. it was low res. And and I mean, that, it's still pretty fast. I had a really fast. That one hundred one computer games had a maze program in it. Yeah, but it wasn't very good. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't very fast. <laughs> no, it wasn't fast at all. But it did generate the perfect maze. I, I, I literally haven't looked at this stuff in like forty years. I, Actually, but I, I, have, I have a visual memory of uh, a program I wrote that it started out and it, like it just made the maze on the screen like while you're watching, yep. and then it puts like. Maybe it was like head on. I don't know, but but it was like they put your square yeah, yeah. his character, and maybe there, maybe it was a two player game, and then you have to go through the maze. And, yeah, and if you bump into a wall, restart. Yeah, yeah, which is funny because there's a um, there's a whole Japanese genre of game that 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 is about that that started. I think it was maybe in the late '80s, and that turned into a game show, a physical live game show. Where, where contestants had to hold a metal pipe and they can't touch the metal edges or they get electrocuted. They get shot. Like this is on TV in Japan, right? So so they're like the two people competing against each other. They get the pipe, they go. And they're like trying to do this and not get shocked and drop the pipe and everything. And then that turned into like Neo Geo games, which show that Japanese game show, but from the side perspective. And now it's like parallax scrolling, and you're just trying not to touch the edge. And, and that translated into pocket PC games where you're using your finger and dragging something through a maze and you can't touch the wall or you start over again. So that idea has gone through several versions of it, even the live TV version. Yeah, and then the Tron race is kind of a, almost a Yeah, return. totally, totally, which is a snake, right? Yeah. It's like the, the snake game. And now I'm starting to like get mental images. Of it. There was one I did in low res called Midas. Uh, it okay. was like everything you touch turns to gold. Oh, that's and so it was like you're moving around the screen and then these colored boxes pop up. Some of them are small, some of them are big. Yeah. And you get points depending on the area of the box when you turn it into gold. But if you, uh, like, if you're going along and something pops up in front of you and you run into it, now you've got this massive gold thing okay. the blocking the screen. So as you get more points and more of the screen turns to gold, you yeah. get sort of choked off. Yeah, yeah. So, so it stays simple. there, right? Yeah, but there's strategy because you want to avoid the... I think they come, they pop on and off. You want to avoid ones that are really valuable, but they come at, at a time that's going to block you off from the rest of the screen. So okay. it's sort of like the same idea as kicks. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was that was great. Yeah, yeah that kicks. was a great game. I got really good at kicks. That was when I was in college, <laughs> I remember playing it. That was cool. That was like 83, 82 or 83. I, I would just like build out these like spikes and pitch and then I'd wait. And oh yeah, just try. And then I would just connect it and get like 90% of the screen. Exactly. <laughs> it's really smart because it's just like turn around, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> Risk reward. Yeah. Yeah, you want to build onto the previous stuff as much as you can. So you're yeah. like doing the risk of the least, you know. There was a game that, uh, there's a game that Tom Hall came up with in the 80s. That was such a great, simple game design, and I'm in. I wrote. I'm writing a book on how to program games for kids who know nothing about programming, and it's through Lua. And the example game that I am building with, with while teaching is is the same game that Tom made, but with visual representations that are, are not just low res blocks. But what he did was he came up with this, this design called Walk Into the Dot. That was the name of the game. Walk Into the Dot. And so it's a low-res screen, and there is a white dot, and then there's a red dot. Walk into the white dot. It's good. The good dot is the white dot. And you have a guy who has low-res, who's got little arms and legs, and he's got, you know, he's probably three by maybe five, something like that. And so you move the three by five guy on the screen, and touch the white dot, and now you're on level two. Now there are two red dots and the white dot. And the white dot draws first, and the red dots can overlap the white dot. And if they overlap the white dot completely, you can't leave, so you have to touch a red dot, which makes you go back to the previous level. So, like, no one's gone past level 12. Like, getting past level 12 is really hard because the amount of random red dots, you know, on the screen could completely obscure the white dot, you know, and to get to the white dot without touching a red dot is really difficult. 
because they're, they're big dots. It's not a dot. It's like a block, right? It's like a three by three block on the screen. So it's like, and you know, after the white dot appears, and you're just like, how do I get to? If you could just touch your leg, you know, if your leg can touch it, then you can go to the next level. And so if you didn't, if you couldn't even see a white dot, you just touch a red dot and go back to the previous level. And then hopefully you can beat that and get to the next one again. And hopefully maybe that time you see a visible white dot. And so it's such an easy game design. It's like, you, what level can you get to? And you don't lose lives, you lose levels. You know? Uh, I'm trying to remember what, what it was. It was basically the screen, the, there was two lines at different angles, and, and they could be anywhere. And I think you picked the point, and it would tell you, like, the, the four zones were different colors. Okay. And you'd... But you didn't see the lines. So oh, you would just okay. pick a zone, like, like Battleship, see. basically. Oh, okay, so you didn't and, and even it would, see. And it would, yeah, it would tell you what color they were. And so you had to, I think you had to, maybe you had to find the middle. Oh, Or, or, or you had yeah. to. That's a pretty cool idea. Yeah, and I remember there was a, a contest to write a program that would do that. That's a neat and, idea. Uh, that's like a yeah. this four quadrant thing and it's hidden. Yeah, because it was about slope. It's like, how do you figure it? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, but there was like another twist to the game that I'm not remembering. But I remember there was a contest, and I remember I wrote a program, and I was really proud of it. I got it down to like it was like two lines. Oh, nice, basic. nice. I thought it was really elegant. I, I didn't win the contest, and I was really annoyed. You know, uh, Beagle Brothers used to have two liner contests, perpetual two liner contests. Or can you? What can you do in two lines? It didn't need to be a game. It just needed to be something. Because Beagle Brothers was like a tools and utilities thing on the Apple II. And they also did games because games are fun, and Bert Kersey was just a really fun guy. So, I don't know if you uh, were you a, Bert, a Beagle Brothers person, no. were you like a fan? Because it's it was kind of like a cult on the Apple II. Like it was it was a, a guy who didn't know assembly language. He started a company that made tools for the Apple that helped you make things and and taught as much as you could from what he knew. I remember, it rings a bell, I remember seeing ads. There's peaks and pokes that. charts that he used to put in, in everything that he sold. So you get this peaks and pokes chart, it tells you all of the zero page locations you can't oh, touch. I, I think I had that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and all the memory, look, all the all like here's here's H line, here's H position, like all the fun, all the calls and ROM for for graphics and and uh, yeah, I remember shit. A big, like a big list. Yeah, what was the people part? There's the only they were the only ones that did that. No one else did that. There's like well, there was, they 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 had an Apple II command chart and they had a peaks and pokes chart and they had that for all the years that they existed. So um, there were multiple versions of those. Man, we should be having this conversation like with. Like, even with like the stuff that we sent to the Strong Museum, like just on oh, a yeah. computer. Oh, yeah, so, so you can just yeah, see it. Yeah, so it's all been scanned. Yeah. So you can look at it. Like, so I think I probably kept some of that. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, totally. you have the scans anyway yourself, right? And I, yeah. I have peaks and post chart. I've kept everything. So I have, I've actually, I, I've worked with people at my companies that were Beagle Brothers fanatics that at the company they had the peaks and post chart on the wall, right? Because like Beagle Brothers was, uh, was like, an institution on the Apple II. It was so important. Like one of the things that Bert did was when you when you uh, got a got a program from him that was like a drawing program, like Alpha Plot was the name of a drawing program. You get the manual for that program, but manuals are boring, right? Like they're not fun, right? But, but this is a complex program. You need to learn how to use it. But what he did was. The beginning of the manual is just teaching you all kinds of crazy programs, nothing to do with the program. And so he would have, and this is this is something that, that took me forever to understand. He had a program that was that was like type this in and see what happens. And it was basically ten, you know, line number ten, go to twenty, and then extra uh, zero comma zero plot, you know, colon plot. Blah, blah, something comes something colon color equals something colon whatever and it was a 256 you know it was basically it was a big block the line number 10 was random and then line number 20 was something some other just uh, an actual line you would understand not understanding that that was machine language turned into basically you're looking at it right it's like actual assembly language that when it's listed in, in right after the line number of basic says go to 20, after that is assembly language, but it's turned into tokenized basic. Okay. Right? Yeah. And so when you look at line 20, that lets that basically calls into that, you know, it does something really cool, 
and, and it's you typing so it's tokens. it's not really basic. It's yeah, it's not basic. But you're typing basic to get the assembly in memory, right? That tokenized, yeah, that was that was like the stuff he did. That was that was really like, I understand what that means, or I don't even understand what that means. It's amazing that you're typing, like you're not typing assembly, you're typing in a token that turns into an assembly command. Right, like that's an A9, and this is the, the yeah, zero. Yeah, like cipher. Yeah, <laughs> basic cipher. So that was just one of the things he did. Like it was full of funny. He used to. He was an artist, so he drew. All what was the time. his name? Bert Kersey. So, so one of the things that he did that was really pretty cool was in 1980, the uh, the Super Bowl in the U.S. is always like a really big event and everything. In 1980, he did. All of the readout programming for the, on an Apple II for the Super Bowl in 1980, right? That's just like one of the things he did, and he's like he drew all kinds of characters that looked like they were from the 1800s, like um, like the Smith Brothers cough drops. That those guys kind of became he redrew those characters, but that became his logo, Beagle Bros. It looked like it was from the 1800s, and so his all of his stuff was was made up of of characters with names that reference programming stuff like algorithm, uh, you know, len, a string, um, just stuff like that, flow chart. So yeah, so Bert, I have his email address, I know where he lives, all that kind of stuff. He will not do interviews. They started in, in at least 80. 80, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, I see what you mean, because you started in the 70s. 78, 78. <laughs> yeah. To me, that was so early, you know, 1980, I mean, that was when Nasser did you know, his first games and easy draw and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, so but the, early, the late 70s was the absolute beginning of the computer game industry. You know, like, 70, it wasn't really before 76 in a big sense. Yeah, um, the Apple came out in 78, right? Uh, the Apple came out in 7. Well, 1 was 76, the Apple 2 was 77. There was, was 77. a revision in 78. Um, I got mine, I think it was, like, it was... Like the fall of '78. Yeah, yeah. It was an Apple II, integer basic, 48k, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it was. I mean, that's really early. And in the Apple II industry, that's about as early as it got. The very first game companies were formed in '78. There, there may have been some 19. I, I, I think I might have a 1977 tape somewhere. I, I remember there was some. It was about a year, it felt like, that I was getting ready to buy my first computer, and I yeah. really wondered which one to get. And th there, I was collecting ads, I was going to so computer So you're looking at the Pet? Commodore Pet, the CompuColor. I never heard of that yet. Yeah, there's something <laughs> called the CompuColor, which, and like, they're all saying they're better. Like, oh, of got course they do. Colors. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's so funny, like, I, mean, I remember hesitating for a long time between the Apple II and the CompuColor. If I bought the CompuColor and, like, spent all those years making games for the CompuColor... You know, like, life would be so different. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. We wouldn't be sitting here. Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, but I spent three years making this awesome CompuColor game. And, that, yeah, yeah, and it died, it. you know. And it's so funny because back then there was so much, too. A lot of people, when they... When, when, uh, when, when we talk about the beginning of the industry, we're like, I tell, I, I, in my in my talks, I say that the the game industry was really founded on these three computers: the Commodore PET, the TRS-80, and the Apple II. Those were the first computers that people had a lot of that they played games on. And I'm not even mentioning the the 60 computers that happened before it before that were that, yeah. computers that never lived, right? The Zeniths and the, the Heath kits and all of the you know S100 bus computers that were just only the EE people would put them together. You know, like I'm I'm gonna buy the cards and put them into the motherboard and I'm going to buy a case or make a case for it and all that. That's not consumer level anything. That was all hobbyist stuff that like you're hardcore if you're going to do that. Yeah. Um, the, the Soul, you know, S-O-L. Uh, yeah. Oh my God, the Soul. <laughs> Why does that ring such a bell? That was actually one of the ones that might, might have gone somewhere like the Wangs and uh, Burroughs and you know, all these really early things. The, um, People don't remember the, the sheer number of hobbyist stuff that happened in the 70s when it yeah, was trying to become an industry. Yeah, and a Soul computer was one of the popular ones back then, too. Yes, there was a Soul 10. I remember was the first one was the Soul 10. Um, 
But there were so many computers uh, that came before the, the real industry founding computers. And in, in even even if uh, you, you, I'm not sure if you remember, but in 1984, there were so many computers that you could choose from in 1984. And you would only know it if you read Byte magazine, because Byte covered everything did have a that existed, Byte right? While. There's like Kilobod. You know, there's some of these magazines, and, and Byte would cover, it didn't care what, it covered everything that was a computer. In 1984, there were computers that came out, like the Jupiter, it came out with fourth in ROM, and it had a joystick next to the keyboard. People were pumping out as much as they could to try and capture the market, like what's going to win, you know? And it's like the Apple II was already chugging along and burning everybody up, and the Apple Atari and the Commodore were, were out by 1984. Um, but it was amazing to see, like, these computers with, you know, fourth in ROM, if you can program fourth, it's a basic, you know? Uh, <laughs> When did the uh, when did Creative Computing magazine start? That was like in the seventy six, right? Yeah, it was in the I 70s. had a subscription for that. It was seventy six because the tenth anniversary was in eighty six. Okay, uh, I actually wrote. I think that was my first uh, income from programming. Is I wrote a couple of articles. To really? What were they? Do you remember? There was one about Pascal's triangle, solving Pascal's triangle. Yeah. And then one was like I don't know, basic programming tips. Nice, nice. Yeah, that was uh, Creative Computing was the first subscription that I ever got and the funny thing is the only reason why well I, I, I read some I, I didn't have anything when I was a kid like I had no books or anything so I, I luckily sometimes got a magazine right and so I remember getting a creative computing magazine the first one I got was December of 1982 it was a green cover with a digitized like Santa Claus on the front and David Lubar wrote the articles for the Apple cart and when I got this magazine and I look at the apple cart and he's basically deconstructing beer run, right? And he's writing the assembly that must be happening for the oaring of the blimp, you know, the, the, the way that the drawing commands are happening on the screen. He's like deconstructing Mark Termel's game in, in, in this article. I'm like blown away. I'm like assembly language. Oh my God, these are the techniques. This magazine is the thing, even though it's just Apple Cart, because they covered all these computers, I only cared about the Apple Cart thing. So I was like, I told my parents, please, I need a subscription. This is what I'm looking for. I need this information. You know, like this was it. Little did I know that was the last article that he wrote in Creative uh. Computing because he left and John Anderson took over, who, had, who, who did games for Adventure International, Scott Adams' company. Yep. He did Eliminator. That which was a pretty cool defender. Yeah, Dave All and uh, yeah, Dave All was creative. Was uh, creative computing? Was he? It's a, but John Anderson was involved. Too. John Anderson was. Uh, there were two John Andersons. One was a writer, and one was a game developer. And there was the presidential candidate. Oh, probably. <laughs> but John Anderson, the writer, died in San Francisco when there was an earthquake. He was on his way to a magazine meeting, and a wall fell on him in San Francisco when, when, in 1989 when the quake happened. I thought it was John Anderson, the game programmer. So I wrote a blog article about it, just going, oh my, you know, it's really sad that blah, blah, blah happened. And John Anderson, the programmer, contacted me and said, I'm alive. It's not me. It was the other John Anderson, you know. The 1989 quake. Yeah. I was there. I was in San Francisco. No way. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Is that crazy? You were there? Yeah. <laughs> you survived, yeah. That's crazy, huh? Yeah, 89. That was the, the year I finished Prince of Persia. Wow. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It was published in 89. And SimCity came out that year, too. <laughs> Those are the two big games of that year. <laughs> SimCity was 89, too. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Will had left Broderbund because yeah, he did SimCity out on his own. And he did... <clears throat> so Raid on Bungling Bay was his first game. Yep. Um, you know, that was a Commodore 64 game. Do you know how he made it? You made it on Apple too. Uh, right? I think you told me that, yeah. Yeah, the Commodore keyboard was horrible, right? And so he had an Apple II, and he was an Apple II assembly language programmer. Everyone looks at Will Wright as this, this designer, who he is, he's obviously a designer, he's an amazing designer, but he is a 6502 assembly language programmer. That's where I, he started. I think, I'm pretty sure when I came to Broderbend the second time in 86 to work on Prince, to do Prince Persia, yeah. I, like, Will had just left and I got his old desk. No way. I didn't know he was even there. I would expect him to be an external author sending stuff in. 
Yeah, when was Raid on Bungling Bay? Or maybe it was earlier. Raid on Bungling Bay was before 89 because SimCity was 89, so Raid had to be 86. Okay, because I, I, I was at Burger in the summer of 84 to do Karateka. Then yeah. I went back to college, I finished college, and then I went back in 86. Okay. To, to so maybe it was 85, early 86 or something yeah. that, he raid, that he made Raid on Bungling Bay, which was a Roadrunner universe, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it must have been because they were making the, the beige boxes then. Like that like yeah, that's right. The Broderbund beige boxes. I actually have the author's guidelines from 1984 or 85 from them, and it's great because there's a picture of David Snyder in it. You know, some people around the monitor. I'm like, that's David Snyder. He wrote Dazzle Dry. He wrote David Snyder. <laughs> Magic. Oh my God, that's David Snyder. And it's funny. The, the funny thing is, David Snyder Eric is actually still an active programmer. And so he's, you know, his, you know, David's not, but Eric's still out there, and everyone can email Eric anytime they want to ask him questions about David <laughs> if you want to. Part three. Roger Shank. Okay. And he's still around. I think I just saw him on Twitter. Oh, wow. Okay, so he's still. I mean, he was pretty famous as a. I guess an artificial intelligence researcher. I mean, this is like in 1980. One. Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> and, and so the idea that like faculty at, at Yale would start a company, especially like a computer software company, was very new. Yeah, yeah. And very But they had a little office. Um, they, they put up an ad in the computer science department looking for Apple II programmers, and a, a friend who was taking this is the one computer science class I took. Mm -hmm. uh, brutal si uh, class. I mean, I, I spent so much time on that class. Like, screw it. It's like. This is taking too much time away from you know, making my Apple II games. It's like, That's exactly I, how I, I feel. I, mean, I, don't, I don't want to be paying tuition so I can like be, do something I'm not passionate about. Doing. Well, and also programming, like the same incredibly difficult, challenging programming assignment that everybody else in the class is doing at the same time. So we're yeah. going to end up with, uh, with like 150 identical programs each one of them took hundreds of hours of work yeah do the same thing like what a waste <laughs> it is like i'd rather take like art history and, own thing yeah yeah and then like go back and like spend that programming time working on uh, well at that time it was death bounce <laughs> <laughs> it's all you needed to make death bounce right? yeah you needed to do that or caretaker wouldn't have been what it was so but i, I needed you know you know i needed to live so <laughs> they, this, they were willing to pay me to program exactly so, this, is, uh, this is what you do but yeah so, so the assignment was it was an educational program to teach kids to read so the idea is that uh, a picture would appear on the screen and then you had to hit the letter that it started with and then the more sophisticated like a version, for apple or yeah, something yeah it was that you had to spell out the whole world the whole word okay and so with every key you hit the letter would appear on the screen and would animate if it was correct oh okay cool yeah yeah so like i think like egg you you'd see an egg and you hit e and then a crack appears in the egg oh. then you hit g and like a little Head pokes out and you hit the second G and it's a chick. That's pretty cool. Yeah, nice. So it was basically uh, even crazy. understood that kids need that kind of feedback back then. Yeah, it was you know? really one of the first. Uh, wow. Right. So, so that was like the basic pitch. Okay. This said, is for AB scenes. Yeah. Was, okay. Yeah, I went, I went there and I said, "Look, this is what we want to do," and uh, I can't remember if, I, if it was exactly that or if maybe the idea of animating was, you know, you know was something that. With like I said, a counter pitch, like this would make it even better. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but um, revision, whatever it was, it was uh, you know we sort of agreed on what the parameters were this uh, this program were, okay. and then they you know, okay, do this and we'll pay you, we'll for pay it. you. yeah, hell yeah. And it was, it was some huge amount of money. It was like four thousand dollars. Wow. For, like doing that was a car back then. Like that, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was a whole car. That's crazy. Yeah. So. So I did like in my spare time. I was making this game. And it was basically just making twenty six, you know, animated drawings, and, yeah. then, and then writing the code, to, like typing the letters, and nice, and playing music too. Apple oh, wow. II music. Oh What were you using to do that? Did you use any third party? It's probably stuff, like the, the it's probably the SC assembler at that point. Yeah, but what were what what were the to, to, to play the music? Did you have any other uh, third party stuff that you used? No, like, I don't think so. I think it was just the built. You're doing tone generation, tone generation and all that. Yeah, I had a table. Of, Oh, you figure out what the notes were and what yeah. the frequencies and all that. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I mean, you could only get, go up to, you, know, you didn't have that much resolution. It was 256 possible notes. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, which is still a lot of notes, you know, like for all the octaves and stuff. That was pretty good. Yeah, but it was... Uh, was it one, one, 
it was a one tone at a time kind of thing. It wasn't like yeah, this was before uh, multi tone. I think it was only okay. I had, there was a routine which I used for karateka, which had two. One had vibrato. Ah, like okay. you could either do the straight. Yeah, the tone, or you could do it with vibrato. And, and actually, yeah, in the opening, yeah, karateka music, you can hear that. I totally remember that. You used vibrato for yep. some of it. <laughs> I don't remember where I got that routine. Was it in the Red Book? I don't remember the Red Book having any duotone stuff because that was uh, more advanced. That was like the voice came out with something like that. Um, I, and I know for Prince of Persia, you know, Kyle Freeman, who later was an electronic arts programmer, yeah. had written this really kind of brilliant Apple II music tune, which could give you harmonies by alternating very quickly between two different frequencies. That was, that's why the music had a sort of boom, 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 Yeah, boom, yeah, sound because, right. yeah, and that's the way that you had to do uh, multi-tone, you know, multi-note uh, programming, because you're trying to do two things at the same time, and the Apple only does one. So you have to, like, interpolate, you know? So it was, it was always a hassle. I don't remember if you know who, uh, who's starting to get, like, I don't know if you remember James Nitchell. Jim Nitchell, uh -huh. who was kind of like the music guy on the Apple II. Uh, he, he created a company called Cavalier Computer and he did Bug Attack and Microwave. And his games would play music the entire time you're playing the game. I remember that, how did he do that? He was interleaving everything. Like his main loop was a ton of calls into his music stuff interleaved with all the code to make the, the game work, right? Because in order to play a time, you had to slow down you had to basically freeze the screen while you were playing the exactly note. so he had a million calls in his main loop to update the sound so it was like it was a music driven you know it was, the music had nothing to do with what you're doing on the, in the, the screen except that the music was so important to blow people away yeah. that he spent most of his cycles or at least half the cycles on that you know um, but it was yeah it was he blew everyone away with both bug attack and microwave but yeah, so there were there were a few people doing uh, multi-tone music stuff on the Apple, and it ate your CPU. I mean, it ate cycles every time you tried to make any noise. So it was a big deal when you made noise, you know? Because yeah. it would stop everything. Yeah, I mean, my guess I would just like put the music at pauses, like moments when yeah, the characters like, like in your, a pose your cinematic, for a your few cinematic stuff where you're showing Akuma sending out the raven or the eagle or whatever to go, you know, just like, whoosh, go kill him. You know, it's like, da -da, da -da, yeah, da -da, yeah da -da, he da -da. points and then play the music. <laughs> yeah. And he does something else. It's a like perfect time to eat up the whole CPU, yeah. right? Um, but then during the gameplay, there's no music. It's just like, of course. You know. So, yeah, it was, uh, you have to use it at the right time, but it was so, like, it was such a big deal when you had a game that had music constantly through it and it was smooth and the gameplay was smooth. <laughs> that was true insanity, basically, <laughs> to make that happen. So if you like watch Microwave, you know, you're like, how did he even do this? Um, and so Steve Hales was a guy who worked with Jim Nichols. And, um, and so Jim, uh, Jim Nichols was invited to my Apple II party, but he died two months before the party. Oh, no. he, had a, he had an aneurysm. And so his, his widow sent me a framed advertisement from Cavalier Computer, his company. So at least I had something to show at the party. You know, like Jim would have been here, you know, but unfortunately he just died. But here's... Here's a really great ad from Cavalier back in, you know, 80, 82 or so. Um, but yeah, it was pretty, he was a, he was a pioneer. Yeah, there's not that much written about him either, but, you know, he was a really I, pioneer. I remember the name, but I don't remember anything about that. Yeah, he was the sound guy in the Apple II, as far as everybody, Paul Ludis, uh, anybody was concerned, he was, like, the guy. Because he spent all his time trying to make some music sound great. Even probably Mike Harvey, who did music construction set, would say Jim was a huge inspiration. Yeah, maybe his name was on one of the routines I used. I, I, I remember P. Ludus. Paul Ludus. That's yeah, Paul Ludus. It, but it said P. Ludus. In the, like, wow. So, so Paul Ludus wrote a multi-tone um, sound routine. Or, or maybe that was just the basic single tone. No, well, Paul no, Ludus wrote audio stuff. So Paul Ludus yeah. was also... Paul Ludus came from JPL. And he lived in a cabin with no electricity. But when the Apple came out, he had electricity run to his cabin in the woods just so he could have the Apple II on and program it. So I don't know anything about these people. Like, they were just names. Like, <laughs> oh, he wrote Gra Graforth. And I don't know if you've ever heard of Graforth, but it was 
It was a graphical fourth language on the Apple II. He wrote uh, Apple Writer. If you ever remember Apple Writer, which is like one of the, you know, it's Magic Window was probably the earliest Apple II text yeah. editor. And then um, Apple Writer was like the really good one before Apple Works came out. I, I think I might have had that. So he, he wrote Apple Writer and he was, he did uh, Space Raiders, which was Star Raiders from the Atari ported to the Apple II. Um, so yeah, Paul Lewis was a, an, um, he was brilliant. I mean, he was an astrophysicist who decided he wanted to program the Apple II, so he already had a career in everything. Yep, yeah, so next time, next time we'll uh, see if we can get people to go to have a crazy